Let us begin. All right, so this uh, is going to be about serverless. Who here has some vague idea of what serverless is? Oh, a lot of people. Fantastic. All right, so uh, just real quick about myself. My name is Misha, uh, co-founder of Jeffridge, our current software company, and also previous company with John. Uh, I'm from Berkeley, California. I do computer shit. I've been doing computer shit for about 15 years professionally, uh, and I'm a developer. And I also know uh, things officially about Amazon uh, Web Services. So I'm going to talk a little bit about serverless and about operations, deploying your software, running it from a developer's point of view, not from a operations point of view. I want to talk a bit about designing applications to be cloud native so you do as little work as possible for uh, the most product benefit and business value. And talk about some of the pros and cons about serverless applications because they're not perfect, they have lots of issues, but they also can solve a lot of problems for you and talk about like the actual you know, cost, money, money of serverless. So again, I'm a developer, and there's been uh, traditionally a bit of a divide between developers and operations. Uh, so operations is the people that take your code and run it somewhere, put it on you know, the internet so people can talk to it on the internet. And developers write the code. And in a lot of companies still, <clears throat> developers don't really understand how their software runs in, on the internet, don't really care so much, they write the code, they hand it off somebody else's problem to put it online. Uh, there was kind of a recognition that maybe we want to combine these things a bit, and so people came up with the term DevOps for developers that do operations uh, to try and combine the roles. Uh, so developers more understanding of the kind of server environment, and operations people maybe write some code, uh, script things, uh, that kind of thing. But really, it, it kind of ended up with developers and DevOps. There's still a divide in a lot of places. Not everywhere, but I, it's very common to talk to, I interview a lot of developers and I'm like, have you ever deployed something, you know, or set up your own server? Like, no, I just write the code, you know, that somebody else, that's what DevOps do. So I want to uh, recommend that you take advantage of the cloud and of serverless as a developer, because developers have a lot of power now because you can script a lot of operational things, especially as we move up the levels of abstraction. So <clears throat> one of the big levels of abstraction, layers of abstraction that come up in the last maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was the cloud. And the cloud is kind of a big buzzword. A lot of people are talking about businesses are like, oh, I'm getting on the cloud now. Oracle is selling cloud servers and cloud databases, whatever. Uh, and a lot of people were like, oh, you know, what is the cloud? Is it really like that big a deal? Uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, cloud is just somebody else's computers, you know, because they're smart asses. Uh, but it's not just somebody else's computers. There is a bit of a different paradigm. There is uh, some value in the cloud that's not the same as just running your own server, uh, whether it's your, like, web server in your basement, like I used to do, or, a rack, like, a server in a rack in a co-location facility. Uh, <clears throat> the cloud does have some real uh, distinctions from just running uh, you know, a uh, data center virtualized. So some of those things, like, we can use the economies of scale. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're hosting your stuff in Amazon. Amazon has a team of people dedicated, paid money, to watch the servers. If the hard drives die, they put new ones in. If something goes wrong, they get, you know, an alert. There's teams of people, staff, that are just dedicated to keeping their hardware up. They can focus on what they're good at and use their largesse to do this very well. Uh, you know, people say, well, why don't you host your own stuff? Why don't you, you know, why do you trust Amazon? What's so great about them? And I trust Amazon a lot more than I trust myself to keep my applications up and my services up. They're a lot better at it than I am. Uh, <clears throat> and by taking some of this responsibility for monitoring services and providing services, uh, it, I can make it somebody else's problem because my business is not really about configuring load balancers or mail servers or DNS servers or storage. That's not my business. Unless your business is providing storage to people, that's not your business. That's not what you want to focus on. You want to focus on whatever your product is, whatever your business does, whatever value you can bring to your customers. And that's really the whole idea here is uh, it used to be like it's not technology that your business really is. Your business uses technology to achieve some sort of product or some sort of goal, but technology is just a tool that you're using. It's not the end goal uh, to write code. You, the, your code is solving some problem. 
Uh, and then also, again, as developers, we can script all these things. <clears throat> we can write code to provision infrastructure, and uh, we don't necessarily need a team of operations people configuring servers and uh, deploying stuff for us. We can do it ourselves. And most likely, you probably are dealing with web applications, just statistically speaking, or similar types of applications, database-driven applications, that sort of thing. Now, a lot of people have been doing web applications, database-driven applications for a long, long time. I've been writing web apps, I don't know, since 2003 or something. And the thing is, they're solved problems. Hosting a web application is a solved problem. You shouldn't be reinventing the wheel and doing it yourself from scratch. We all, like, there are companies dedicated just to hosting your software and doing, like, deploying database-backed web applications, for example, like Heroku or Amazon. It's a solved problem. Don't spend your time uh, doing a problem that's already solved for you. Uh, now, maybe some of you have a special application that has a very complex architecture that you designed yourself. You know, it needs to run FreeBSD over here and communicate through some fancy message queue over here, and you have custom operating systems and everything. Uh, okay, you know, maybe you have some special snowflake that uh, won't fit in some serverless model or traditional cloud model, and that's cool, but you probably don't. You probably have, you know, something that is a solved problem that other people have built similar things before. So, again, why reinvent the wheel? So, the cloud is... Uh, the idea of using these managed services from a cloud provider or from somebody, some other service provider that you can take advantage of. Databases, message queues, sending email, all that kind of stuff. Uh, now serverless, again, some same people that say uh, a cloud is just somebody else's computer say, well, there's not really serverless because, you know, there's a server somewhere, right? Oops. Let's go back there. Well, preview. So people say, well, you know, there really are servers. It's not actually serverless. But again, that's missing the point. And serverless is not really about one particular technology. It's not really about functions or uh, using managed services from your cloud provider. It's more of a mindset. It's more of an idea, a way of thinking. And that way of thinking is about what I'm saying. Focus on the business value. Focus on whatever your product is. Focus on whatever uh, value you can bring as a business to other people. And again, that's probably not configuring load balancers. It's probably not setting up storage servers. Uh, that may be a way that you want to achieve what you're trying to do technically, but it's not focusing on your business. The more time you can spend making your product better or your uh, whatever you're trying to deliver to people better and hopefully working on making somebody's life somewhere slightly better, that's what you should be focusing your time on. That's what you should be concentrating on. If you're concentrating on you know, setting up a mail server and maintaining it and watching and monitoring it, that's not really the best use of your time. That's not what you should be worrying about. That's the serverless mindset. Okay, now I'm done. You all know about serverless. Now, it would be a short talk if that was all I was talking about. So I'm gonna talk about uh, functions as a service because this is a core component of serverless. Of, it's a result of the idea of trying to focus on business value. <clears throat> Uh, functions are a technology, it's not the point, it's not really what serverless is, but if you're going to focus on your business value, on your product, you're, uh, you want to have the least amount of uh, management, of setup, of configuration. What you really want to do is take managed services and glue them together. And you need some code, probably somewhere, to glue you know, your database together, to your webhooks, to your web application, to your REST API and everything. And we need some code to run. Now, the idea is not that there are no servers. There are servers and serverless. Just the point is we don't care about the servers. We don't need to know where they are. We don't need to worry about them. We don't need to care about the servers. We just want to run some code, really. That's the point of a server is to take your code and run it somewhere. And so functions as a service is just kind of stripping away everything else and just focusing on the code, on running your code somewhere on the Internet. You don't really need to care where. So I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about AWS Lambda, and the reason for that is because it is, first of all, Amazon basically invented the concept of cloud computing. They also invented the concept of functions as a service with Lambda, and it's by far the biggest cloud provider. So, and I also have the most experience with it, so it happens. So the idea of functions as a service is you write your code, you put it somewhere, you don't really care, and you invoke that function somehow. So 
You can write your code. Um, you can do it in any sort of runtime you want, more or less, as long as it's kind of like a Linux x86 sort of thing. Uh, most people use JavaScript, like Node.js, and Python. A uh, little bit is done in like .NET, Java, Ruby, Go, but vast majority is Python or Node.js, people do. Uh, and then you want to deploy it somewhere. So usually what this deployment step consists of is you take your function code and you put it in a folder along with your dependencies and you zip it up and you upload it somewhere. And that's really all there is to it. So your function probably has some third party libraries that you use, maybe from NPM, from PyPy, whatever, and you need those to execute your function. So all you really have to do is just take those dependencies zip them up with your code and upload it, and you're done. You put that code in the cloud, and then you can call that function. And there's many different ways that you can call the functions. Uh, probably the most common and popular is through API Gateway, which is a HTTP endpoint. So if you want to invoke your function by calling, making a API, uh, sorry, HTTP request, uh, that's very common. But there's many other ways to invoke functions as well. You can have them uh, like be invoked as the result of things happening. So if you, you know, use an S3 bucket for storage, if somebody uploads a file, you can trigger a function. If you delete a file, you can trigger a function. If you have IoT devices, they can be sending messages to the cloud that invoke functions when the messages arrive. You can send streams of data that get processed by functions, including WebSockets. Uh, and you can, uh, you know, uh, you can also just make an API call. So you can call a function from another function or call it from some other unrelated piece of code just with an API call. You can do it synchronously or asynchronously. Doesn't really matter. Your function is just there. You run it. You don't care about where it is or how it's being executed. So why do we care? What's so great about this? What does it give us? <clears throat> well, we get a lot. If we work within the constraints of serverless, it does give us a lot of things uh, that we don't have to spend any effort building ourselves. <clears throat> We get high availability. If you're trying to set up servers, load balancers, containers, whatever, trying to maintain uh, high availability, now it's your problem. Now you have to be concerned about, you know, are my servers running? What if they're not? I have to, uh, you know, replicate data, do backups, all that kind of stuff. If you have functions just running in Lambda, they, um, they're just there, basically until uh, the sun runs out of hydrogen or Amazon goes bankrupt. Maybe that'll happen, I don't know. Uh, but the functions are always available as long as you put it in there. Now, yes, Amazon can go down sometimes, sure, in one availability zone, but your functions are across different availability zones in a given region. So as long as that region is not hit by you know, an atomic bomb or falls into the ocean, you're probably going to have your functions still be up. Things they talk to may not be up, but you, know, it's, you get a very decent amount of high, high availability without even trying. Uh, you also, every time you deploy a function, it's actually, it's not replacing the existing function, but creating a new version. So if you have dependencies, or you have old code, or you have microservices that have, uh, expect, you know, one particular version of your code to be running, you can point them at a specific version of your code. And then if you do a new deployment, it's not a big deal. You also get scalability. <clears throat> So the default uh, limit in most regions is 1,000 concurrent executions. So your function can be being invoked simultaneously 1,000 times. It can be higher in some regions or if you really need it, but you probably don't. Maybe you do. I don't know. Uh, but your function will automatically uh, be scaled, be highly available, and it's not something you ever have to think about. Again, it's running on some server somewhere. It's being scaled up somewhere. But who, you know, how it works, how it happens, don't have to care not part of your business. And it's pretty cheap, and we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> uh, and you can also, uh, each function can perform some particular uh, function of your application. So maybe you have one function that reads an image from an S3 bucket, another, image, uh, another function that sends an email, and they can have different permissions. You can give that function exactly the permissions and access to resources that it needs to do its job, and uh, thereby reduce the you know, attack surface of your functions, increase your security posture. Uh, here's a couple pictures. Uh, this is Amazon's console showing you some logs, showing you some data, some errors, how long your functions are running for. This is serverless enterprise dashboard. Uh, shows you uh, how much memory you're using, how long your functions run for. Uh, this is one function's execution. We can actually see API calls, how long they take within one function and kind of get an idea of maybe why 
you know, uh, profile in your function. It'll also tell you uh, if you're making like uh, HTTP requests or database calls, uh, you can profile that very easily. Uh, and also just kind of see all your requests and errors, always errors. So uh, the, the building blocks are really what the cloud providers give you. They give you the ability to deploy functions, invoke them, uh, and uh, monitor them. But they don't give you everything necessarily that you want uh, as for a production application. But what people can do is they can take these building blocks and build a nice software product on top that you can use that I'll say email you if there's an error or give you nice graphs like we saw. And all, again, all this uh, applies not just to Amazon, which we're uh, talking about specifically, but it generalizes to the other providers as well, Google Cloud Functions and all the rest. So I want to shout out serverless framework. This is what we use. You don't have to use it. Uh, there's lots of similar things. But it's just a simple command line wrapper around Amazon's API that gives you, you know, ability on the command line to deploy applications, view logs, monitor things, and all of that. Uh, it also uh, lets you easily integrate with CloudFormation or Terraform if you're into that. So you can describe your infrastructure all as one package. So not just the code of your application, but the resources it uses. So maybe your database or your storage or your DNS or your mail, uh, mail sending, all that kind of stuff. Message queues, you can package it all as one application, as one package and give it to people. So you can give uh, your whole setup to someone, they can deploy it and have the same uh, infrastructure that you do. You can use it to create a development environment that looks just like a staging environment, that just looks, like, looks just like production, all by just running one command to deploy the whole stack of everything, all your resources and everything that you need. Uh, and it also has some great plugins, uh, which is one of the benefits of the serverless framework is that people write plugins for, say, giving your API a domain name or packaging up Python requirements, uh, dependencies, or uh, talking, setting up IoT devices with serverless and all kinds of other good stuff. Uh, and then taking all of this together and all the resources, all the managed services that your cloud provider can give you uh, really lets you put together all the things that you need to build your application and doing as little work as possible, being lazy and not reinventing the wheel, focusing more on what your business does, which is unique, and gluing everything else together that you need. So again, the, the point here is not really the technology, the point is the technology for using these things can save you a lot of time. It makes these things not your problem, it makes you not have to worry about you know, where your servers are or if they're up or if your database is replicating or backing up, it's all solved for you. All you have to do is put them together. And I really like this because I am lazy and I don't want to deal with setting up uh, Nginx for the thousandth time. So some of the benefits we get from this are that we uh, don't have to create our own deployment system. Uh, we get our infrastructure uh, written as code so we can deploy it and package it and give it to other people. Scaling, high availability, all the stuff I talked about. And we don't really need any DevOps team uh, necessarily. You can fire them and they can you know, get a real job. And we can just focus on writing software and delivering business value. But I'm also not gonna claim that this is the answer to every problem. There are uh, lots of drawbacks and limitations to functions as a service, uh, to Lambda and all the this type of uh, technology. So it's not for everyone and I don't recommend it um, across the board all the time. There are uh, let's, let's talk about some of the limitations of it. One is you are stuck with your cloud provider. If you are using all these services of your cloud provider from Amazon or whoever, you're kind of st stuck with them. And there are uh, people that say, well, we can have multi-cloud, we can kind of abstract away the differences between the cloud providers. And then if someday we decide we want to switch from Amazon to Microsoft Azure, it's no big deal. Uh, this, nobody who has any experience will tell you this is a good idea. And you're kind of, if you're abstracting out what your cloud provider gives you, you really, uh, you might as well not be doing this at all. It's, uh, it doesn't really work out because you need the specific features that the cloud provider gives you. For functions, uh, also I just kind of, you know, live with the fact that Jeff Bezos owns me, you know, so I'm not, I'm stuck with Amazon. If uh, they suck one day, then I'm kind of screwed. Oh well, I'm okay with it. Uh, if you need like serious computing power, if you need a lot of disk, RAM, CPU, GPU, network, 
functions uh, may not give you that. <clears throat> if, if you really need to run like uh, a lot of CPU intensive applications, for example, 24 hours a day, you might be better off buying your own hardware. <clears throat> it's also your application is running in a shared hosting environment. Some people are cool with this, some people are not cool with it. Um, sometimes people have compliance needs for processing credit cards or medical data that may not be happy with you being on a shared hosting environment. And there are real security concerns as well. There are hypervisor exploits and things of that nature uh, that you are exposed to that you wouldn't be exposed to if you had dedicated hosting. <coughs> Uh, one thing that bugs me in particular is you can't really emulate uh, a complex cloud native architecture locally. And so I like to have a nice local development environment. <clears throat> It'd be nice to you know, take my computer somewhere and not have internet access and be able to test everything and write everything. You can't really do that if you have any complex setup. There's a few things that you can emulate locally, like for example, DynamoDB is sort of a document store, NoSQL type of database that Amazon gives you. You can do that locally, but for the most part, um, you kind of need an internet connection. And this one kind of bugs me a lot. And then there's also the cold start time to consider. And that's when your um, function hasn't been executed in a long time or um, you have concurrent requests coming in and it needs to spin up your function in another container somewhere. Um, there is a bit of a cost associated with the startup time. So maybe tens or hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, and then you also have your application startup time. So if you have maybe a compiled Go application that might be pretty small. But if you have a JavaScript or Python application with a lot of dependencies, it may take, you know, a few hundred milliseconds at least to start up. So if you get a cold request in, you don't have like a warm uh, Lambda container running. Like if you haven't gotten in any requests in 15, 20 minutes, Amazon may uh, kind of move your function somewhere into cold storage. So the next time a uh, invocation comes in, there's a bit of a delay while it comes up. So if you need your request to always, if, if you need your functions to always run in a certain amount of time, uh, or your application takes a long time to start up, it is something to consider. You can solve this uh, one way is with money. You can pay for reserved concurrency, so Amazon will make sure there's always, you know, however many uh, versions of your function running at a time. <clears throat> uh, but it is something that a lot of people complain about. Uh, the functions can be really useful uh, if you're building microservices, if you have uh, functions, need code that needs to run in reaction to events. So, like I said, from IoT messages or uh, things happening in your storage bucket or uh, message queuing is very popular. People use message queues to uh, trigger functions and you save some state in between. Yeah, what's up? I got a question about uh, versions of functions. How do they differ, actually? Versions of functions, how do they differ? Yeah, because you said that they are stored like in a cold place. So, when you talk about the delays, you said that they are stored in a cold place and there are several versions of it. So you're asking about the versions and the, the functions being stored. So your function is just a deploy package. It's a zip file. And so when uh, you Amazon wants to uh, invoke your function, it has to take that zip file from somewhere and put it on a server. Um, it's usually, um, if, it, if it hasn't been invoked in, say, 15 minutes or so, uh, it may get rid of that function out of memory to make room for other functions to be run there. So there is uh, that that time delay of fetching your function from wherever Amazon stores it, starting it up in the container, loading your code into RAM and all of that. Um, there are different, you can version your function, like I said, but uh, it's always, the, the versioning of your function is separate from that whole uh, plane of control. Uh, also, functions can be used great for web applications. We run most of our uh, REST API servers as Lambdas, they're Flask Python applications. They're like any other uh, web application you might run on Heroku or in G Unicorn. It just happens to be running inside a Lambda. Uh, it's also great if you have webhooks that you need to process, maybe like from Stripe or from Slack. If uh, you have, if you want to react to these events, uh, you can just write a function that's always there and ready to be invoked. Um, and also, you can operate on streams, uh, and you can even have web sockets that, um, when messages come in, call some Lambda function and you don't actually have to keep the connection open, you can have um, the API gateway keep your WebSocket connection open, you don't have to worry about it. It just tells you when a message comes in, it runs a function and you can react to it. Uh, and then there also are ways of processing large volumes of data in a similar fashion if there's streaming, but that's another talk.
Now, some of the use cases that I do not recommend using functions for are, again, if you need a lot of power, if you need a lot of disk, network, uh, RAM, CPU, uh, functions are pretty limited. They also have a limited execution time. Uh, right now, you can't have your function run more than 15 minutes. So if you have processes that need to run for a long time or consume a lot of resources, you probably shouldn't use functions. Um, also, there's a size limitation as well. Functions can only be about 250 megabytes right now. So if you have a large application, well, it won't fit, sorry. Um, and then again, if your application has a high startup time, you can use reserve current concurrency to kind of solve this issue. Uh, but again, you're, um, it, if you may have a variable number of requests coming in or you don't want to pay much money, this can be a drawback uh, if you want to keep your requests within a certain uh, latency. Uh, and like I talked about compliance, um, and there's probably lots of other things that you can think of where functions aren't uh, a good fit for you. Um, a lot of people are into containerization. Uh, there's a lot of use cases out there, I'm sure, that this doesn't fit into. I just don't really run into them. Maybe they're out there. I'm sure people can come up with ideas of things that this is not appropriate for. I just don't really encounter it that often. What's up? Can you just slap a Lambda AMD64 binary to a Lambda? So the question is, can, so the question is, can you just compile, uh, you know, x86 AMD64 binary and just run it, uh, create your own environment? And you can, um, as long that you can. Uh, Amazon's it runs on Amazon Linux, which is essentially CentOS. Um, if you build your application in that environment, you can execute it on Lambda. So people do this um, because maybe some people want to run, I don't know, Lisp or Haskell or some other goofy thing instead of the runtimes that Amazon provides you. And you can do that. You can totally build your own, uh, your own binaries and your own runtimes. You can even package these up as Lambda layers which is sort of, uh, it's basically a file system overlay. You can publish it to the world and other people can use your runtime environment as well. Uh, Jetbridge, we publish one for Psycho PG2, which is the Postgres um, connection driver for Python. People use that uh, because we have to compile it. So we just make it available and other people that need that in their environment, they can just use it from us. Um, now, maybe you don't want to host your own servers, but maybe your application doesn't fit in the Lambda or you already have an application, you can't really uh, fit it, you know, take your existing thing and re-architect it. There is uh, other kind of serverless-like approaches that aren't necessarily functions as a service. And again, serverless is not really about any of these technologies. It's about doing whatever you can as a business to focus on your product and on your business value, not really on one particular technology or another. So some people go with AWS Fargate, and the idea here is um, instead of functions as a service, it's more containers as a service. So if you want to run your stuff for a long time or you have Docker image, you like Docker for some reason, you can Dockerize your application. You can give it to Amazon, just say, run this container. I don't really give a shit where it's running. Just, you know, make it go. And this is kind of something in between functions as a service and your own hosting. So let's talk a little bit about the cost of doing all this. So the, when you're running functions as a service, what you're built for are gigabyte seconds and invocations. So the gigabyte second measure is how much RAM and CPU time your application takes up. So um, it's usually more like the 100 millisecond uh, megabyte, but it's the same idea. You're, what you're built for is how much RAM you use and how long your function runs. So you're really, really, really just paying only for the compute time that your application is using. This is great for um, you know, people that want to scale. It's great if you're starting out. It's great if you're really big too, because it's pretty cheap. And it's also good for your cloud provider. Um, and you also do pay for the number of times your function is invocated, is invoked, sorry. Uh, so just to give an idea of you know, what the costs are associated with Lambda, uh, first of all, you get a million free invocations a month and 400,000 gigabyte seconds, which is pretty good. Um, if you uh, go beyond that, let's say uh, your application, you're using 128 megabytes of RAM, it's 0 0.0000002 uh, dollars per 100 milliseconds, not bad. So if you were to do 30 million invocations of 120, 128 megs of RAM for 200 milliseconds, that's 11 bucks. Not too bad, not gonna break the bank. It's also a lot cheaper than paying the DevOps team. 
but there are, you know, of course, some costs. It's not free to set this up either. You can, uh, you know, it does take developer time to set all this up. Sometimes you have to monitor these services, and usually you want to pay some service provider to do that. So, like I said, there are companies and products dedicated just to letting you know when stuff goes wrong, like if your applications are throwing an error or you want to go look at traces of them, uh, you may want to pay for that service. Uh, you also, if you have an API exposed to the web via HTTP, you pay for that as well. So you do pay for the API gateway costs as well, uh, the invocations, like I said, and also your other resources that you may consume, obviously. Um, but you also save on uh, not having to worry about operations. You are not monitoring servers. You're not responsible for keeping things up. You're not responsible for backups. Uh, it's somebody else's problem. You don't have to buy hardware. You don't have to lay out capital expenses. Uh, you don't have to pay site ops people to run around and put new hard drives in when they fail. Uh, and you're also not paying for the unused capacity of your system. So if you, let's say, uh, have own server hardware or you buy VPS or virtual machine slices or containers or whatever, you're probably not using all that capacity. Your application is probably not consuming all your disk, all your network, all your RAM, all your CPU, all your GPU all the time. Most likely it's not. And so you're actually wasting money buying that capacity that you're not using. And if you have uh, variable spikes in traffic, then you, uh, you need to provision enough resources to handle those spikes, but you're not using them a lot of the time. And again, you're just wasting money. Why not just pay for the exact compute resources that you're using? Uh, and then you also, uh, again, don't have to monitor things yourself for the most part, other than the application errors that your code is throwing. But anything outside of that, anything infrastructure related, not your problem. So in conclusion, the future of DevOps professionals will be polishing AWS Lambda server racks for Jeff Bezos. <laughs> and DevOps people will be out of a job. That's my vision. So uh, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. And I want to remind everyone <laughs> that we do have an office here in Wrocław now, and we are hiring. And we're looking for great developers, so feel free to hit us up. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. If there are, yeah. Have a microphone. So, uh, so um, fair, thanks for giving that talk to us. And uh, since we are having you, we are hosting you right now in Wrocław. Uh, uh, then I would like to ask you about the concept of, of a Docker because I'm not very, I'm not quite familiar with it. And I, the concept of what? Concept of Docker. Docker. Is, because you use the word Dockerize something, Dockerize the runtime mm -hmm. environment or something or some component. I'd like to, like, I would like you to expand more on it because I'm not familiar with it. Okay. I'd like to know. Sure. So expand on Docker. So Docker is uh, a technology for containerizing applications. And a container um, is uh, the idea of packaging up kind of a runtime image of your application and its dependencies, um, basically a file system. And you can create this. Uh, you may have uh, you know, a somewhat complex application structure where you have you know, libraries or files in certain places or data files, and you may connect them to other uh, resources as well, like say a database. So Docker lets you containerize this, um, and uh, it's different from a virtual machine. So a virtual machine actually emulates the hardware of a system. So it may emulate an x86 CPU, for example. A uh, Docker container is actually not virtualized at the machine instruction level, but it's virtualized by your kernel. Uh, Docker is a um, particular technology on top of Linux containers and C groups and a number of other technologies that live in the Linux kernel. And they kind of give each process a view of the system where it looks like it owns, you know, it's, um, owns the process space, owns the mount points, uh, has, thinks it has lots of resources, maybe doesn't. Uh, and it gives you a way to package up your application in a way that's sort of um, contained, hence the word container, uh, in its own kind of virtual environment, but it's still sharing the kernel. It's, you only will run one copy of the kernel. If you're running for different virtual machines, you actually have multiple kernels, and that uses up a lot of RAM, and it's not as efficient. So instead of uh, some hypervisor emulator uh, mediating the virtualization, you have the kernel doing it instead at, at a much higher level. But the system only works for Linux-based applications. There are 
uh, FreeBSD jails and things like this. Um, but it only works for those sorts of applications and you can't run it on other um, hardware. So if you want to emulate MIPS or ARM or other instruction sets, Docker won't help you there. So a lot of people these days build applications with Docker. Um, it's very popular because people have complex setups. They have you know, their database, their Kafka message queuing, they have all kinds of different pieces that they put together and they've created a nice little custom snowflake because they think that their application is special and nobody's done what they're doing before. Uh, as you might guess, the, I think that a lot of these applications really aren't that new or special. And um, if you want to take advantage of the, all the resources, managed services that your cloud provider can give you, um, you don't necessarily need to containerize your application. Um, again, a lot of people are fans of this. Uh, a lot of people, there are a lot of use cases out there where you need to containerize your application, create an image. I'm sure there are. I just don't run into them. Uh, it's just not an issue that comes up if you're um, taking full advantage of managed services that can be provided. Okay, so the fundamental difference is that the Docker shares one kernel and the virtual machine shares multiple ones. Yes, Docker, share, Docker is contained by the kernel and virtual machines are emulating uh, a CPU basically and other resources, I.O. and all that. Uh, yeah, you want to see? Why Amazon, not other providers? <clears throat> well, uh, like I said, in, Amazon is, has been around the longest. They invented cloud computing. They invented uh, Lambda functions. They have a vast, vast array of um, services out there, everything from satellite downlink to you know, video transcoding to storage to everything. Um, and also, it is the most popular. So there are other services out there, and they are not as popular. And that is a important factor, because I'm using not just Amazon, but I'm using tools written for Amazon by a community. There, um, because Amazon is the most popular, there is the most software support tools and everything else built around it. I'm sure there are fine tools built around Azure or IBM Cloud or whatever, uh, but there's not as going to be as much support uh, for less popular cloud providers. And they are the biggest, and they have just vast amount of money and resources behind them, and they've been doing it the longest. So, does that answer your question? Yep. Usually, you said that uh, HTTP API is usually um, um, the separate cost, yeah? So, I would imagine that buying a Lambda function is just an execution environment. Why would you pay for the interface to the, your execution environment separately? I can, I can imagine that HTTP you can replace with WebSocket and whatever other interface, but what, why pay for the interface separately? So the question is why buy the interface uh, to HTTP separately from uh, the execution environment? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know the reason why Amazon made this design decision off the top of my head, but I would guess that um, it's running, let's say, an HTTP interface is not just about running code. Uh, your application should not be dealing with HTTP clients directly, and there's a number of reasons for this. So one is uh, you may need to terminate SSL, and that's a very CPU-intensive thing, and there is hardware designed to terminate SSL specifically. So if you have a high volume of SSL traffic, you don't want to be running that in your execution environment. Uh, furthermore, let's say clients are slow, like maybe somebody's uploading a file to you. If your application, if your execution environment has to process that upload, now you're tying up a web worker all the time that somebody's uploading a large file to you on their slow connection. And that's really not a good use of your resources. Um, and HTTP, their API Gateway has a lot of other features too that I haven't gone into. Um, they can set up authentication, uh, you know, doing JWTs or API uh, keys. Uh, handles a lot of logging stuff for you. Uh, custom domains, you can map domains and various paths, uh, you know, all the redirect stuff, all the things that you might get in a traditional web server. There's not, um, it's a lot better performed by specialized software and hardware than doing in your execution environment, in my opinion. I don't know the answer to your question, that's just my guess. That answer, more or less? Give me an idea. Yeah. 200 milliseconds doesn't sound really, it doesn't sound real. What's the actual code, cold start times? Yeah, yeah so. Let's say for JavaScript applications. <clears throat> so the cold start time is 
uh, two things. It's a sum of uh, Amazon side of things, of spinning up a new container to put your function in, and your application itself. So uh, your application, your application startup time is dependent on all kinds of things. Like I said, if it's loading libraries in the RAM, uh, and if it's a compiled app versus an interpreted app, then it has to start the Python interpreter or what have you. Um, although this is only the first time this function in this node is in invoked. So if it's warm, then when new requests come in your application, it's not running a daemon. It's not saying they're running, but it, it, all your libraries are basically loaded. Bas you can think of it as all your import statements are already taken care of when it's a warm invocation. Uh, on Amazon side, uh, the length of time, the, the, the amount of time that the cold start takes is variable because it changes over time because they're changing their infrastructure. It used to be a lot longer. I think, I don't remember off the top of my head what it is these days, but it's, I would, 20 milliseconds maybe, I, depending. It, it, it depends on a number of things. It also depends on if your um, function is running in a VPC, a virtual private cloud, which is basically like a, a private subnet on Amazon, um, it used to have to provision a network interface that was inside the subnet, and that was very time consuming. Uh, but they made adjustments to that, and now that uh, virtual network interface is attached when your function is deployed, not when it's invoked, and so they're able to reduce that time quite a bit. So, there are, it's not usually enough to kill an HTTP request. It's not, <coughs> excuse me, not usually enough to kill an HTTP request. Uh, again, if it really is a concern for you, if Whatever the time is, I don't know, but say 30 milliseconds is too much for you. You can always reserve concurrency. You can always say keep this number of uh, functions warm, for example. It all depends on what your latency requirements are, basically. Answer your question? More, More or less. Or less. <laughs> I, I can imagine it favors compile applications. Since they have, like, you can precisely control the startup and all that. Compiled application, you can control what Amazon does. Sure, a compiled application is, if again, if it really is a major concern, compiled application or reserved concurrency is a good way to go. If your compiled application is really, really big, there's still a little bit of time that it takes to start up as it gets loaded into RAM and all that, but yeah, it will be less than starting some runtime. Let's do one more question. You there. How often does the cold start need to happen? If you have constant usage, then your functions don't really get cold. So uh, in Amazon right now, this is about 15, 20 minutes. It varies. Um, it has some to do with uh, the, how it's packing the functions into its various container services. Not something you really have to care about. It's abstracted away for you, but underneath the hood, you can go read about uh, how Amazon actually provisions uh, uh, resources to run these things. And they have their own virtual machine called Firecracker. Uh, which you can look up if you're interested. Um, the cold starts happen when your function is not invoked for 15 minutes or whatever it is, um, then uh, it will no longer be warm. And then uh, new, uh, if you get a new invocation, it'll have to spin it up. It also happens when you have concurrent requests. So let's say you have one container uh, in Amazon. Um, again, container, I'm kind of breaking the levels of abstraction here. It's really, you have one function. It happens to be in kind of Amazon's Firecracker container. We don't have to care about that. But Amazon somewhere has your function spun up. And if it's executing and another request comes in concurrently while that one's executing, then you will also uh, potentially incur a cold start time as well, as it has to spin up another one somewhere to process that request. So if you start getting a lot of simultaneous requests, they can all potentially have cold start times uh, because it, um, it ha doesn't have enough running to handle them concurrently. And so that's, those are the two ways that you may incur cold start time. All right, thanks everyone for sticking around.